Yeah. <sighs> well, my name is Diana Pampo, and I have a deep love of nature, and you know, birds just happen to be part of it. However, I have an altruistic wanting people to know how to use binoculars because I will tout my own um, goodwill. I donated these two library backpacks, and so if you're not familiar with them, these are provided by Audubon of Kansas in order to get people more interested in bird watching and stuff, and they come with binoculars. Oh my God. And so I thought, if people, and these, you can check these out for a week. Yeah, a week. Yeah. And they have two sets of kids' binoculars and one set of adult binoculars. And I thought it might be good if you've never used them to know how to use a pair of binoculars. Are those the kids? Yeah, these are the kids. Okay. Um, so, are you all familiar with how to use binoculars? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I wasn't, and I've used, I mean, I, I had some, but I was, I was unaware of a couple of their uh, features <laughs> until I had somebody show me. So, I've got several pairs here. These are cute. I've obviously never opened this bunch. But I've been informed that people are checking these out, so that's pretty exciting for me. <laughs> well, here you go. <laughs> so I've already heard something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and it doesn't matter what kind you have. I'm sure that they all come equipped with the same thing. This is convenient. <laughs> Here, so list of everything they come with. Uh, each one has the three pairs of binoculars, uh, identification guides for birds and butterflies, and county information sheets with locations to go nature adventure packing. Mm -hmm. wow. You brought your own. Well, then you, cool. you got your own too? All right. <laughs> So you're gonna think I'm crazy, and you would be right. <laughs> but one of the best ways to introduce children to binoculars is with something as simple as a toilet paper roll. Because what happens when you put these up to your eyes? For one, it teaches them to put something up to their eyes to see. But when you do this, you're taking out all your peripheral vision, so you learn to look through something and to actually see it. So you can actually just glue these together, Put a string around them and they can walk along and, and who cares if they break into it? You know. <laughs> <laughs> I have another belt. Right. So you can just, and it really does, if you've never looked through something like that, it really does focus you. Obviously it has no magnification, but you can still see. Mm -hmm. Then when you get to the binoculars and you look them up and you're like, oh, that's cool. And you know that you got this little knob up here. But the way to actually focus the binoculars is the right lens always moves. So what you do is when you pull them up, you close your left eye, focus on your right eye, and it would really help if I didn't on it. Yeah. <laughs> and when you're looking, then you're going to focus with this little knob on the right. So you're going to focus your right eye with the knob on that right side, and then you use the middle one to focus the rest of it. And so once you've done that, you can really oh, you know, so yeah. This is supposed to be it is. It may so not on those kids. I, well, and yeah. sometimes, like on mine, it is the left side. It is the left side. It, it, it changes. That's interesting. It changed. Well, the reason is, and I didn't realize because I had trouble most broken. This side, <laughs> this the right is a zoom. So when I turn the right side, it changes the uh, really. Yeah, um, and I didn't know my. I don't think my left, I think only my right one moves. Yeah. I mean, the thing that it does is it, it corrects the different, one side adjusts, you find the side that adjusts, you don't look through that side, you look through the other side and get it focused, and then you adjust the side that's adjustable, so there's a differential between your eyes, especially at long distance. That's, what, that's why there's an adjustment. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah. <laughs> but now this one doesn't. 
And for the oh, kids, it may yeah, not okay. because the less moving parts you've got with kids. So you look through the one that doesn't adjust, and you focus, and, you focus yeah. and then yeah, and then you wink your eye, and your your other eye will be out of focus, and then you turn the one that does focus until the until it does, and now you know they're both. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's kind of it's kind of goofy, but if you have bad eyes like I do, and you can't do that. But I know don't work for you. They're always blurry. But you, yeah. can, you can only have one eye yeah. to work. Okay. It's really annoying. And then you with the Here, you want to try the one that actually moves. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so the kids don't do that. And then, of course, they move in and out to adjust to your eye, how far apart your own eyes are. And sometimes I think the kids' ones, they're not as powerful, so they. they First of all, kids are going to have better eyes as a rule. Not always, but as a rule. Not always, but yeah. But if they're not super, uh, if the magnification isn't really great, they won't see it. And with binoculars, you can spend a whole lot of money for that little pair that Judy has. Those were $100. Mm -hmm. And I, that is my standard pair just because they're really lightweight to carry around. The magnification isn't as high as some of the others will be, but I think that the general purposes, those work really great. And I carry them in my car right down in my console. If I happen to see something, I should pull over <laughs> and, and look. I can't tell that there's any magnification. Really? So you'll, you're probably going to have to take your glasses off. It's really hard to use well, them. Well, I had them off. Yeah. And I couldn't see much without them. So if we see you, you're driving. How come the of you drive? So I have a red in palace, so you might want to see that. If we see you with your binoculars up, we should just what, get it's off. It's really good. Okay. I go out on some country roads now and then. I have a bad habit of just stopping in the road <laughs> and looking at them like, well, oh, there's somebody behind me. I guess I should get over to the side of the road. Like, why is there somebody here? Okay, yeah. hey, well that that does work. Focus the left one and then bring the right one. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. And you can go out and look at birds without a pair of binoculars. You know, it's just a little easier with some and the most frustrating thing about going birding with a pair of binoculars is by the time you actually figure out where on the branch it is. <laughs> And you it's get to focus, they, look, so they fly off. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. Yeah. I'm probably not going to get this back in here right there, but that's all right. right. We'll get it. And then I've learned, I used to go on a lot of um, trips with a bunch of people, and one of the guy who always drove this vehicle I had a spotting scope and you get it out. Well, I learned quickly this has one purpose when you're birding. You're watching a heron sitting on a log fishing because it's going to stay there for a while. Because by the time you get this out and adjust it, you're not going to do it for just any bird. Although I've taken this out for a walk sometimes. <laughs> it's kind of an odd thing. Welcome. Sorry, we started without oh, you. That's okay. I had to go home and give her Okay. So we have a pair of binoculars just for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got some of them, huh? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Any of you watch America's Got Talent? <laughs> Heidi Klum is always when people are acting, she's always got her hands up like this. And somebody asked her why you do that, and she said exactly what I'm saying. It, it makes me focus my eyes on what I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, that's, yeah. You know, it really does. So. You know, start your kids out with a pair of these. And then they learn they see something. I mean, maybe you'll see a goose right here and you can just take them up and they learn to locate and then pull up. And that's also a real trick too, is when you have a pair of binoculars, is locate where the animal is, the bird, anything. And then put your binoculars up. It's still gonna keep you long, probably find where it is. So we were talking about, you probably are an expert at using binoculars. I did not say that. Who's <laughs> 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 the back in there? Oh, 
<laughs> I was finding the whole idea behind me having this class was um, very self-centered on my part because I donated these two pack, these two um, backpacks to the library, and they come with two pairs of binoculars for kids and one pair of adults, and you can check them out. Wow. And they come with three pairs of binoculars, identification guides for birds and butterflies, and county information sheet with locations that you can go to. And so they're able to be checked out. And they are provided by Audubon of Kansas to libraries around the state. But I'm very passionate about bird watching and nature, and so I felt that this library should be. I have a question. What's the purpose of? Of these coming up, and they, um, it's got something to do with how you how they sit in your eyes. So I have glasses, mm -hmm. and if you don't have glasses, then you can adjust that as I recall. Am I right? What she's asking about this? Yeah, uh, no, how they they'll come up and down, come up and down. And from what I remember, somebody telling me is it has to do with where you if you have you wear glasses when you look at uh, binoculars. Yeah, and you know, people have different, some people, some people have really deep set eyes, and that does matter. Like, I know, I think my dad always complains that he has to shove the binoculars in his eyes and it hurts. Yeah. Oh, okay. And so I think that that's, you want you want to adjust that so it's comfortable. Because you can tell, like, when you look in, if your eyes are too far apart, there's like a floating circle. And you notice that, like, you know, if you try close enough, there's, uh, there's like a floating circle. So you do, yeah, you do not have, Super deep set eyes, so you can probably get your eyes right in there. Why don't you use binoculars? Can be a quite a finesse thing. Mm -hmm. So don't get discouraged when you're out. And the great thing about bird watching is you can do it from your couch, assuming you you can see out your window. <laughs> you know, I noticed in yesterday. the basement it would be difficult. But. I noticed yesterday I hadn't used my binoculars in a while, so I was just like, you know, like fumbling. And I would say, Where is it? Yeah. I, and I would say that, like, before you go bird watching, so you don't get frustrated, it's just like go outside of your house, sit down, look at things you know where they are that aren't moving, try to look at them and then find them. Work out all the focusing stuff. You'll be much happier. I was very frustrated this year because and things were few and far between. Like we didn't see. Yeah. There were just tons of birds like sitting on branches. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of pigeons flying. I thought it was yeah. Yeah. And it's very frustrating to try and watch the birds soaring in the sky too with binoculars because you'll think you got it and then it's oh no it's over there and then. It, there's a skill toward using it, but don't get discouraged. Yeah. yeah. Just keep trying. It's not a perfect science, for sure. And then the other frustrating thing about going bird watching is you'll see a bird, and you'll even be seeing it in your binoculars, and there'll be two people with you, and you can stand there for 10 minutes, and you will not be able to direct them to where that bird is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You will say, it's in the third tree over here, and see that? Why? Oh, yeah, I see that. And then there's a group of leaves. Yeah, well, it's right there. <laughs> Everybody will become frustrated about it, so go. Anybody got any questions about the binoculars that I probably can't answer? You want to try and see how that works? I mean, it's amazing. Well, actually, yes, it is. It is. <laughs> Hi, Mary. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it does. It makes you focus. Yeah, it really makes you focus, which is kind of what binoculars do, and then obviously they have the magnification. And you can get, obviously you're going to get with a spotting scope a much higher magnification, but you can get pretty good magnification with this group. And then, uh, say most pairs of binoculars like these um, are going to be about 150 or 200, and then you can tell. <laughs> How about the spotting scopes? The spotting scopes, I think, will run. I didn't buy a really super expensive one. Um, I think this one is only about 150. And then I bought the tripod, and then I went to set it up. <laughs> That's not going to be any good. <laughs> If I have a table where I can set the oh, spotting yeah. scope, then it's going to be great. So then I had to go buy me one with the telescoping legs. But there again, unless you've got something that's sitting still, 
for a long time, I wouldn't bother getting a scope because it is so frustrating to me to try and watch birds with this much. Just when you get it focused, because they're not easy to focus, because you've got um, you got an adjustment up here where you can get your different magnification. Then you've got the one here, and then some of them will even have the lens that you can move in and out. Yeah, <laughs> so it wasn't one of my more. And then the table can't carry. And you stop in the middle of the road. Yeah. Set up your table. Yeah, yeah. so I don't want to get behind a red Impala. Yeah. Because <laughs> you never know where I'm going to stop. Uh -huh. Did you consider getting a leather mouth on your window? You know what? A friend of mine, we both decided we were going to get the ones for the mounting on the windows, but the angle that they're at, it sits up so high, you can't see out of it. So I've seen people with that, with the, the window mount, do better with cameras than with spotting scopes. Because I've seen a number of wildlife photographers, they never get out of their car because they've got a window mount that they just took their camera to and then they just drive around from there. So once you've got your binoculars and you're ready to go out and you go to go birding and you may or may not care what you see, you just see a bird. Years ago, when I first started, I was told to get a book similar to this, and now everybody has things on your phone. Some people will take a bird book like this, and they will write, they will just carry it with them, and oh, today I saw a killdeer, and then they will write down the date that they saw the killdeer on here so they can get to know what they're seeing and when. But I was told to get a book that's similar to this. Because what it does is it has pictures of the bird, but it's more like your average bird. Where if you get one that has pictures, it's just that specific individual. And the rest of them may not look just like that individual that they've taken a picture of. So if you get one like this where it's just got pictures, it's got the average field markings. So now we're going to do some bird ID, unless you got some more questions about the binoculars. That I was a bit curious, so I won't be able to answer. So, birding basics. There is a list, and Sarah said she would copy this for anybody that wants it. And there's a bird list, Kansas bird specific list of species to Ellis County. So, it would help to know when you're looking at a bird, and then you think you've kind of figured out what it is in your bird book or on your app, and you think, oh, it's a blue footed booby. <laughs> no, no. And then you look and you're hearing like, oh, those aren't in Ellis County, so that's probably not what it was. Back to the drawing board kind of thing. But this will kind of direct you to when you're in your book, and then it will have ranges too of where a bird is located, where the breeding range is. I don't know if you can see this or not, but where the breeding range is, so it has summer migration breeding range. So you'll know if you see. The Carolina Wren in the winter, and maybe it wasn't. Mm -hmm. I'm just using that as an example. They may be here in the winter, I don't know. Uh, but it's just ways to narrow down. It was <laughs> so, you know, all of, it will give you a range for every bird. So if you get, okay, that bird is in this range, but is it ever been seen in Ellis County? So there's like Peterson's Field Guide. I think it's just drawings as well. Um, Sibley, Sibley, Sibley. Is it a national conference? They may. Oh. This was just sold by the Nature Center that I oh. <laughs> the state park I worked with. So I supported so you, them. You, you go with what you know. That's right. I got you. Plus, you know, all of my friends had this. If you're on a birding trip, you want a smaller book. Yeah. Um, you can also get your, your smaller set. book like this one. one back there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big giant one. Yeah. 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 She pulled out yeah. some great books over here, but this has got to be my favorite because I think it describes me. Field notes from an unintentional birder. I think that's how I started. <laughs> <laughs> I was just out for a walk and you know, birds fly by. I was mentioning on our bird walk yesterday, um, we're starting a sunflower chapter for the Audubon, 
And so we went on a bird walk yesterday. And I said, you know, I've often questioned, why does everybody go bird watching? Because everybody can see it. Kids can see them, older people can see them. How many people can go out and go mammaling? Well, you just don't see a lot of mammals as you walk around. But birds, they just fly by. So some beginning bird ID, and you're going to know what they are anyway. But oh, now it's not moving. <laughs> Why did it move the other time and it didn't? So we know what that is. No, we? <laughs> what, what I've been told about these owls yeah. is that depending upon where they're, what region they're from, they will blend in with the majority of the trees that are in that area. So this gray horned owl is blending in with, this is probably a cottonwood, judging by the look of it. But they all have something in common. <laughs> so we look at their beaks, their faces, their eyes. I, I want to see one of these guys. This is yeah, an Eastern cute. Screech Owl. They're about what four inches tall. I was gonna say it was a little tall. Yeah, four inches. Four inches. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're not wow. very big. Oh, maybe six, but yeah, they're little guys. Really large voices. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I've heard one. Oh, really? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So in the owl group. These were all owls. What did you notice about? What was the thing you noticed the most about these owls? Round head, big eyes. Round head, big eyes, and their eyes don't move in their socket. Yeah, they don't move in their socket, which is why people say, well, they can turn their heads 360 degrees. They can't, but they can move them 270 because their eyes don't move. They have to move their head. Oh, okay. And the ears on the owl, so that is just tufts of hair. So if those are his ears, all owls would probably have those. Barn owls like that do not. They don't have ears. Hmm. Your, your they have ears. That's how they echolocate. But they don't have the the well, they don't have the, yeah, they don't have yeah. just the gray horned owl and the long eared owl uh, yeah. and then that screech owl. Those are just feathers. They're just there for decoration. They actually have ears. And on an owl, their ears are not even. Huh. One is higher than the other. And that's how they echolocate because they can tell from the sound where the sound hits their ears. It helps them pinpoint because these guys. Except for this one, are night hunters for the most part. This is a burrowing owl. So okay, so yeah. I was on the Ellis, my little thingy I had. Uh huh. So does that mean that it lives in the ground, or is that just a yeah? They heavy? typically live in, in prairie dog burrows. Okay. Oh, okay. In abandoned prairie dog burrows. Because hmm. I was like, why would they call it a burrowing owl? It's just a burrow. Yeah, and they. <laughs> They burrow into the ground, but they don't dig their own burrows. They go in. Okay. Prairie dog pounds for the most part. I don't know if they're exclusive to prairie dog pounds because in Colorado, where I lived all the time and saw them, they were prairie dogs are everywhere. If you've ever been around the Denver area, burrows are not the thing. Yeah. They share with the Wow. Okay. And these are mostly insect eaters. So if you have prairie, if you have burrowing owls. They love grasshoppers. So Good. Go for, on. go for burrowing mm -hmm. owls. But what's the other thing that you notice about the size of their head? Their eyes are big. Do you notice anything about their beak? These are all raptors They're in the raptor family, so that means they're meat eaters. So the beaks on these guys are for tearing. So they tear at their their food. So they eat. Most of their carnivores, I mean, grasshoppers, meat. Yeah. But these guys all eat meat. So these are from the raptor family. And they're, I, mean, I don't think you can see the talons on many of these guys. You can see them on that one. And that's the other thing that makes a raptor a raptor 
because they have long gripping talons. So they will go down and when they catch their prey, they catch it with those talons. Now the other fun thing about owls, owl pellets suck. <laughs> For the most part, owls swallow their prey whole, which is all the indigestible bits too. And you know, they can't digest it, so what do they do? They keep it down in their stomach and they're like cats, they just throw it back up. So if you've ever seen a place where you know owls are roosting, if you look out on the ground, it's very different from the poop. It's actually a pelleted thing. And for it'll be about that size for a great horned owl. Obviously that will screech owls in the rest of them. But they throw up the indigestible parts. It's pretty interesting. So wherever they roost, you'll find the little owl pellets on the ground. And you know it's not bird poop because bird poop, you know, we all know bird poop. So an owl pellet comes from its stomach. Mm -hmm. from, okay. okay. It upchucks everything that it can't digest. So if you dissect it, which is really fun too, you will see bones and you can tell, you'll see feathers, you'll see hair, so you know what that owl, his last meal was. Are they round or? They're usually oblong. You know, they, they're shaped. I mean, that it could be different, but usually they're oblong because they got to get it back up yeah. through their, you know, their, through their esophagus. Just an interesting point. Yes. If you, if you Google owl pellets, you yep. can actually buy them. <laughs> I actually have bought them. <laughs> Alan, put it in your cart. <laughs> you can buy owl pellets. And the way, if you're going to just find it in the wild, for free, so I don't know. <laughs> you're going to walk away for a while. Yeah. yeah. There used to be an educator out at Sternberg. I just loved to get a group of kids together. And they would dissect these pellets. And then they put it on display, everything that they found. I was so fun. 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 Oh. But if you find one in the wild, please sterilize it by putting it in the microwave because it could have parasites and stuff like that in it. So don't just pick it up and start digging through it. Well, I mean, you could. But you didn't hear that from me. You are not to, you are not to do a raw owl pellet. So you can microwave them. I will say that people that are looking at owl pellets have gloves on. Have gloves on. Yeah, yeah. yeah you can get it. Some stuff from an owl pellet. So, yeah. If you find one, wash your hands really good and then put it in the microwave for you. That's it. Maybe in a paper towel in the microwave. Is there any, there's probably some insect that eats that. Like, there's some freak animal here. Oh, probably. Probably. Yeah. A vulture. A vulture. Yeah, I don't know that a vulture would eat that, but I'm sure there are beetles and things like that. You know, I mean, everything on Earth takes care of everything else. You know, if we didn't have Google vultures that. or... <laughs> I'm still... What eats the... What eats the... I can't get best thing that I could buy. <laughs> Which brings us... Who goes out collecting pellets? <laughs> Do they just keep owls? You go collecting pellets? You did. I'm sure you did. Have you had everybody in this room in class? Because I had them enough for 20 kids. Right? Have you taught everybody in this class, in this room? No. No? Okay. She's only one. She's a teacher for how many years? 44. No, I. Yeah, I would have liked to have been in one of your classes because I, I would have loved going outside with you. Well, my husband said yesterday that's the reason he likes going birding. This is the first time. <laughs> yes? This educator from uh, Sternberg used to organize birding trips when we go out walking. Was it Elmer? No. Farley. Greg Farley? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's sound familiar. This is about 15, 10, 15 years ago. Well, we know where I was that long ago. Oh, not in Kansas. No, not in Kansas. No. But we went down to the bridge down by Ascension, I believe. And there's a whole family of owls living under this bridge. How 
fun. As can you can tell because of all the debris on the sides of the bridge. But like the one that goes over Big Creek, maybe yeah. down there. Okay, yeah. well, that makes sense. I think they're still there. What's the other thing that makes a little mess underneath the little cliff swallows? Barn swallows, but they're mud. Yeah, that's yeah. what I think is under there. <laughs> yeah. So those were all the owls and the raptors. The next one is also a raptor, but the beak's just a little different. Yeah. But again, we've got that curved meat-eating beak. We've got bigger eyes. Now, do you see any similarities between these two birds? The beaks. That's a juvenile bald eagle. So many people will see that and think it's this bird. But this is actually a golden. But you can look at the color of its beak and the color of that beak. So that will tell you. These are little you know, field markings where you can tell what's what because they will not get their white head and white tail until they're four or five years old. And in between they'll go through various stages of molting and so this is, you said this is a ball? This is a ball. This is a juvenile ball. There you go. Now, I don't know exactly which year. Mm -hmm. I'm not that good on. <laughs> when do they get their flying? When they're four or five years old. Oh, so, this is a mature eagle. And eagles will live in the wild about 15 years in captivity. They can live 20 to 25. But the color of the beak will tell you because this is a golden. Also, where they're located, these guys are fish eaters for the most part. But y'all heard the story about why Ben Franklin didn't want this to be. Was it Ben Franklin? Yeah. yeah. Our national bird. He wanted the turkey. Yeah, he wanted the turkey because these guys will eat roadkill, you know, dead things. They're not picky. And where you find these guys, you'll often find ospreys. Because ospreys eat strictly fish, and they're really good fishermen. So they kind of like follow them and, and they see what they're afraid. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We had, we saw an eagle a couple years ago out by our house. Really? And I feel like it was just obviously just stopping, um, which I'm like nine miles north of Via Cemento, um, sitting on a tree by a pond, you know, fishing pond, and but yeah. only one day. We usually saw them. Okay. Have you have we for a while? I had not done the bird camp for four years to try and get the DLT. And did they have like an eagle day or anything like they on giant bottoms or eagle I don't bottoms know. or anything? No, no. There are, so there are there are all the Yes. Yes. There are. How about I don't know if they nest here. <laughs> Yeah they're, yeah, they're probably more winter residents. We saw one. We were driving into the corner to buy groceries. We saw one over on the hmm. north side, up on a highline pole or telephone line, one or the other. Great thing it's about birds. I've seen them at Webster, too. <laughs> yeah, they don't always do what you think they're going to do. So, you know, just because we don't think there's any breeding pairs around here. They don't know that. But they would be more by the lakes. Where these guys are more cliff dwellers. So they're going to be more around. I'm not saying that they couldn't be down here, but they'd be more by the cedar bluffs, like where the bluffs are, and more canyony areas. Because they like to nest in those kinds of areas. And now, what was this one? This one is a golden eagle. There's two, yeah, there's two varieties of eagles in the United States. The wild that we're familiar with in the gold and goldens are more rare to see, I think. And do they get flat heels? No. No, they get the can you kind of see the feathers on the back of this one's head? Which is why they have the golden name. But when they're young, they still get this model area, but their beaks are gonna be that brown. But now we still got those big long talons for gripping our prey. So those all make up the raptors. Vultures are also raptors. So they also have the curved feet and the big talons, even though we associate them with dead things, but they're still considered a raptor. Ospreys are raptors. Anything that is meat-eating like that is usually a raptor. 
and they're pretty easy to identify when they're adults and they're flying. Yeah. Now you could probably find in your binoculars. <laughs> That's the reason it's the bird. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're pretty majestic looking. Yeah. Then we get into some more specialized. So we got here, we have these big hook beaks for eating meat. Then we get into some birds who have a more specialized beak that's not meaty. These guys, I hope I group them together. They have more of a sharp, pointy beak. These are insect eaters. So I look at the feet on this one, they're more for perching. Kind of short legs, aren't they? Yeah, short legs, perching. They have the ability to grip onto a branch. Or the top of the bird feeded. If they have a, a more narrow beak, that they couldn't eat meat if they wanted to because they just don't have the beak for that. Their eyes are more centered on the sides of their heads. Their eyes will move around, even though they can still turn their head. Their eyes do move. Then we get the little guys. So we look at his beak and we got a pretty good idea what this one is going to be doing. What this, um, what this bird is going to be doing with his beak. And his extremely long tongue. So that thing is meant to get into two flowers. So anything that's got a really long, narrow beak like that, it's probably number one going to be a pollinator, but they're looking for things with real deep, uh, which is why our um, hummingbird feeders have more of a, a long cone on them so they can drink from that. And you can hardly ever see their feet. They perch, but not often. Then we get back into some insect eaters as well as um, they have a very thick, thick beak. This is a house sparrow, but its thick, thick beak is for eating seeds. So it wants to crunch seeds. And my theory is that the reason birds migrate is these guys migrate because they're looking for insects. And how many insects do you see in the winter? Not many. But the guys that can eat seeds will stay around because the seeds, they're here all the time. So we've got these kind of more strong, more strong, oh, stronger beak so they can crack open seeds. So we've got a variety in, <laughs> for some people who are fascinated with sparrows. I don't know my sparrows very well. I mean, I know that's a house sparrow because that's mostly my feeders. And that's a white crown sparrow, which is kind of self explanatory. I have no clue what this is, but it has some identifying field marks that if we get into our book, so we know, okay, this is sparrow, so we can get into the sparrow family. Because of the beak? Is that why you went sparrow? Yeah. Okay. Although, frankly, when you go out bird watching, a lot of things you see are going to be LBBs or LGBs. Little round birds or little gray birds. <laughs> That's the same with mushrooms, too. Little round mushrooms. Yeah. So you may just, okay, that's the LBB. And the but there might be some identifying marks on this. So we've got some striping on the breast. We've got a black or a brown stripe, breast colored stripe across the head. So those are the kind of things that you can look up in your bird book or your bird app. And you can kind of narrow it down. Okay, so it's got the brown or rust on the head, and it's got some striping on the breast, so you can start to narrow it down. I'm not going to say that you will 100% ever get the bird, but you at least get closer. <laughs> I was on a bird trip one time, and we sat in this wooded area. I bet for an hour while people got out of the van and went to look at all the different sparrows, I'm like, oh, I'm just going to sit here because I wasn't that interested. And you don't have to This is a different sparrow, and I notice this one doesn't have the striping on the breast, but it's got a white stripe above the eye. So these are all called field marks. It'll help you narrow down if you care enough to really find out what that species is. 
this is, a, I believe it was a catbird. And now we got gray. Then you can got size. Is it bigger than a robin? Is it smaller than a robin? These are all things that will help you identify. Yeah, it really would have been good if I labeled any of these ones. But anyway. Now we get into some more birds. That, okay, this one's by water. So now we're going to get into something that's going to be by water. And somebody told me once that the birds in the beginning of the book are more primitive than the ones in the back. I don't know. I believe that or not. But usually these birds that are on water are near the front, at least. <laughs> so, okay, well, this bird is by water, so we're going to start looking in front of this book. And the most interesting thing about this bird is when you see him, he's blown. Yellow feet. I mean, it is the craziest bird I've ever seen with these yellow feet. It's like it's wearing shoes. And that's a snowy eagle. It's probably maybe half the size of a great blue heron. But we've got a real long beak there. So we're going to say, huh, look what this one eats. These guys are fisher eaters. So he's going to go in and he's going to be able to catch that fish with that beak. We've got another one. This is a belted kingfisher. Another long beak for catching fish. Great blue heron with another long beak. Now, is that a gull? These are not seagulls. They are just gulls. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got kind of a longish beak. Although, as we know, gulls will different gulls will eat a whole variety of things. But you'll generally find these by water because they prefer. Little shell things in the on the, the shore for fish. Then we get into the duck family, and they're either dabblers or divers. Some of them are what I call bottom up birds. So if you see them swimming along, and all of a sudden, like you see, is they're bottom up. Those are the dabble dabblers or divers. What? Dabblers. The dabblers. So they're looking for things that are under the surface. And they have those beaks that are like scoops. And they have webbed feet for swimming. So we've got the kind of wide beak again, and obviously the swimming. But they still have those markings that you can look at. Then you get into the ducks. The females are very similar because they're all really drab looking. But the males, are, they're the ones that are showy, so they're going to have more of it identifiable mark. They're trying to figure out a female of a duck species. It's, it's, it's actually it's easier. Yeah, the curly tail in this one. And the females are loud. Like, we did ducks for 4-H, but yeah. so just like our normal little khaki camels or pecans, they, the, the females are and the males are like, you know, like, you can tell, you can totally tell by the sound of a duck. Yes. Is it male or female? <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying, but help me or something. <laughs> well, that's important. We to this <laughs> in the winter, the males lose that breeding plumage. So these guys are probably not going to look like this in the winter. In fact, I saw a group of mallards the other day. <laughs> My friend and I were just trying to figure out. Somebody said, oh, those are mallards. I'm like, no, they don't have the green heads. And then I looked up the non-breeding plumage or the winter plumage. And the males don't have the green heads anymore. But they do have a very, very blue wingtip that stays. And that and curl the, tail. The curly tail. Yeah. Yeah. But when they're missing some of that really bright image, yeah, no hope. So those are just some just some field marks that you can lose, use to identify um, birds when you're out and about. And maybe you don't care. Maybe you're just happy to go see birds. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. Or maybe you have decided, as a lady who gave a talk at the Prairie Chicken Truck Club, that in January you've seen a number of birds because you've marked them off in your bird book, and you decide you're going to do a big year. How many of you know about a big year? A what? A big year. <laughs> so this is a birding term for really crazy people. <laughs> How many you can get on your list? How many birds you can see in a year? So this woman who ended up setting the record for, I don't know if it was a solo 
it wasn't just for a woman, but she set, I think it was the lower 48 record of like 740 some odd birds. It cost her 20 some odd thousand dollars. She traveled, I don't know how many times she crisscrossed the country. And that was her job for the year. She just went to see how many birds she could find. Them. And those were unique birds. Not just no, they were just, I mean, they were, they were house sparrows. I mean, just birds, but it had to be different. 740 different, different. species of yes. birds. I mean, I'm saying a year, you would probably see more than seven. Or she saw 700 species of yeah. birds, yeah. Wow. So she might have seen 700 sandhill cranes because she went to Carney, Nebraska in the middle of March, right? Okay, but that was only one species, only yeah. Okay. Wow. okay, so she traveled coast to coast. It's a record now, <laughs> it was 700, 742, I think. She beat the rec, the old record, by five or six birds, huh? But she just said, I. It just was kind of lost, and I, I wanted to find myself, and that was <laughs> quite a way to do it. But, <laughs> but these are just some different um, tools for your tool belt, other than your binoculars. Um, there are several apps that you can download. Donna uses Merlin all the time. I have iBirds, uh, or picture birds. They will both record, and then it will give you some... You can record bird sounds and they'll give you some identifiable. This, the one I use tells you this could be this, this, or this, so it kind of helps if you know a little bit about it. You, would you know which birds were right when you find it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But do you have to know which ones they are on here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then I use one on my Kindle. Why I really like that one, e birds, is. If I kind of have an idea what the bird is, like I think it's a mallard, but like that bird I was looking at the other day that I wasn't sure, it will tell you where the range is, and then it will give you similar. So it will go similar, and then it will give me some more. And then I can look at that one and say, no, that's not quite right either. Um, and then I can do similar and kind of narrow it down, and it will tell you what the field marks are on those birds, where you see it, so you can know, nope, it wasn't that one. It, I really like that one, but I don't want to carry my Kindle with me. <laughs> it's bad enough to have a pair of binoculars swinging back and forth. There's some other resources up there about where you can find different walks to go on, where you'll see different birds. Then, if you're really fun, thing to do next April will be the third annual Prairie Chicken Lecture Trek. It's held here in Hayes because in Hayes, we are about one hour from where you can see both species of prairie chicken, both the lesser and the greater prairie chicken. So they will go out at the ungodly hour of about an hour before dawn, and you set up in a blind and you can see the prairie chickens on a lek. And what a lek is is where the males go to display for the females. But we also take lots of other different trips too. We went down to Quivera. Um, last year they also went out to Monument Roth. So you have to reserve a spot. Like yeah. Night. Yeah. So if you want to do any of that, I can suggest... Can you bring your own plan? Yeah. Can you bring your own plan? I don't know. I think you're pretty much limited because you have a you go with the driver from the chicken. And most of the places where we go to look at the chicken are on private land, so she has permission to go look yeah, at. She... But how she found some of these areas to go ask the landowners is she just gets out before Don starts driving down the road listening for them and when she would figure out where they are. So you, you might be able to find one that's not on one of these ones that are on the tours, but this is a unique spot in the world, really, where you can see both, both species. So what's a prairie chicken left? What's left? The left is where the males go to do their display. Is it the, is it the... Yeah, the, where they get the, the, the big bigger. thing, yeah. <laughs> so it's a local location. It's not very big, it might be an acre, an acre or two. Uh -oh. okay. And so, so they're just... See, yeah, the males, see, yep. See a yep, uh, yep. Uh, and the males will be there, and then the females will wander in and out. <laughs> you know, as we females do, we're fickle. But the males stay pretty much on this left. They can only do one thing at that. Yeah, they, that's all they can concentrate on. <laughs> so they're all up there, you know. Christine Channing, who's a 
news person for Eagle, went on one of these about a year ago, and she did an article on Hayes Post covered about three days of writing about her experience. And it was right. a lie. Hmm. Yeah, and you don't have to go on. They go um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and usually there's, they also, I only went on the van tour because I'm lazy and I didn't want to get up, you know, an hour before dawn, only a half hour before dawn. Because they want, you want to be there because the birds will start coming out about dawn. So we want to be there, especially if you're going in a blind because they're right at the left. And it is suggested that you don't drink anything for a while before you go because once you're in there, you have to stay until all the birds leave. So it could be three or four hours in this. Hmm. Blind as big as a <laughs> so, the Yeah, you have to. Uh, and they do take you all to breakfast afterwards. Uh, so you gotta be committed for that one. <laughs> the van trips, they did go and we parked on the road. So we were further away, but you could still see the chickens and hear them because they're pretty loud. And, and they fly a certain way. Yeah, they fly. Like a. Yeah, they just uh, jump in the air. I mean, they're just crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it is fun. But then they don't just do that. So there's other trips, you know, day long trips. That we, like I said, we went to Cheyenne Bottoms, we went to Provera. So who's they when you say that? They. It's the. They this is put on by Audubon of Kansas. Okay. Okay. And so this will be the third annual. Okay. And their base is the best western out there off the highway. And they've been very good about it because you yeah, have all these people there in the crack of dawn. But yeah. So it's really fun. So if you. I mean, if you don't want to go, just check it out. It's a really, it's a fun time. But in the winter time, sunrise doesn't happen until. Well, this is only they only dance like that when it's in breeding season. So in April. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, April. Yeah. So it's in April, and I guess they they will do these displays from maybe the end of March till I think even they said some of them will be as late as the middle of June, and then the hens will go off, and they so. To have the, the males on the left, they need a very short grass. But the females are looking for more because they're ground nesters, so they're looking for larger vegetation places. So they'll have a little bit higher uh, grass and, and things than they were going later in to protect their, their nests. But they don't like trees. They don't like anything high because that is where predators sit. So. So then do they lay their eggs out in a crop field that then gets uh, harvested and they lose their eggs? Or? I think that they're very, by the time, early. yeah, so, whatever, they're not going to, that's not going to, because the winter wheat is probably already up high enough, and I think they would go in that disturbed kind of ground, that they're looking sure. for more or less disturbed ground. And are they like, can't like, 30 days to... Yeah, I'm sure that's probably, yeah. Like yeah. I don't I know exactly not, what it is. But, but Jackie Augustine is the president of Audubon in Kansas, and that's what she did at Visa Sun, and she then did not see very chicken, so she was already happy for everything. Does she know about her newest days chapter? She does. She's very excited. Yep. Yeah. 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 She's been trying to get one here for a while, and uh, so why not? So we just started the sunflower chapter of Audubon, and we had our first bird walk yesterday, and we're going to have another one at the end of October, and it's for all the all ages, all levels. We just we just go out and go by. How do you find out about it? We have a Facebook page, sunflower chapter of Audubon, and I should guess around. No, I have my. Aha! <laughs> and we have a meeting before the next walk, right? Yeah, we have a, a meeting here at the library and in the other conference room. And if we have too many people, that's going to be uncomfortable. So it's just an executive meeting, right? No. But anybody is welcome to get <laughs> So if you would like I'm only a temporary secretary to contact you, you have an email or 
Sounds like a full time job to me. I was already taking out to different meetings, <laughs> different events. If we can find somebody to teach us, we're going to have somebody to teach us how to do the Christmas bird count, which is a national event. So people, you can do it in your backyard. It's just to get an idea of how many birds are in an area. And citizen birding, I think. Don actually could probably teach it. I know you've, you've done it. Well, I, I was a compiler of lunch. Of all the data that was collected then? Well, And you don't have to be an expert. Just count the number of house girls at your feeder. <laughs> how much is that? Uh, is that a binocular? Yeah. How, how much is that in range? It goes up to. It goes all the way up to 60 pounds. No, oh, oh. Yeah, too good. Like, how much are you going to buy? Well, how much are they? I think this one is only 150 or something. Really? Yeah. I think it's pounds. No, that would be my friend Ron. He's the one that buys the thousand dollar scope. Okay. Um, I bought a cheaper one. Than... Thank you for coming, Amy. Hey, it was awesome. She's acting secretary of the chapter. <laughs> <I'm just> secretary. <laughs>